Good afternoon, fellow car enthusiasts, and welcome to Running to Redline. Today, we're going to be testing the difference that the so-called driver mod makes and kind of exploring what it is that you could do to unlock the driver mod for yourself. The test involved the same driver in the same car on the same track at two different times when the driver skill was increased. So the car being used is a 2014 Subaru BRZ Premium with a parent oil cooler and some simple brake upgrades such as brake pads and brake fluid. The driver is actually myself about a year ago to about maybe two weeks ago. So I've improved a lot during that time and unlocked the so-called driver mod to an extent. Obviously there's always time to be gained, but I've gained a lot of ability to push the car to its edge and really get those tires squealing. And lastly, we're gonna be running it on the same track, which is known as the Firm or the Florida International Rally and Motorsport Park. And the Firm is a small track located in North Central Florida in the US. It is a 10 turn track, it's a road course, it's open to the public three days a week. It's a pretty fun little track, there's not many straightaways, there's only really one. So it's not very power oriented, so it's very suited to the Subaru BRZ. So we're gonna be looking at my laps from a year ago and two weeks ago and comparing the differences and seeing what exactly the driver mod means, what I was doing differently, and what you can do to figure out these same things for yourself. So now we're going to take a quick turn-by-turn -turn analysis of the Florida International Rally and Motorsport Park, just talk a little bit about what each turn entails and demands out of the car and the driver, and then we'll get into the actual laps. So starting off here on turn one, it is a pretty medium speed right-hander, pretty high g-force turn. Here you really want to start all the way to the left of the track and make sure that you're touching that nice late apex on the right side and carrying back over to the left. Here the tires will be squealing a good amount if you have the car on its limit. And this leads into a short straightaway that leads into the turns two and three complex, which is a pretty small uphill chicane. Two, for turn two, you have to brake quite a bit because it is uphill and it is actually a blind corner. And then you have to pretty much just ease into the throttle as you go into turn three. You don't want to slot, you don't want to stomp on the pedal or slam the gas down by any means. You want to be just nice and easy with the acceleration. And this will lead you onto the straightaway between turn three and four, and into turn four, which is probably the fastest turn on the track. This is a big, fast right-hand kink. Uh, I was taking it at about 80 miles per hour on my faster laps. It is a pretty scary turn. It's maybe a little bit of light braking, and then you lift off and kind of just chuck the car into it. It's one of those turns that you want to start slow and build up speed as you go to each time, but it can definitely be probably the most intimidating of the turns on this track. This leads into another small straightaway going into turn five, which is once again a medium speed right hander, similar to turn one, which goes into turn six, which is pretty much the same deal. You'll notice that's kind of a theme of this track. It has a lot of medium speed right hand turns, but turn six will lead down towards the S's and the hairpin. This is the hardest, most technical section of the track, with the S's being very punishing if you take a bad line through there. There are pretty high curbs on each side that will unsettle the car if you hit them too hard or you take too much wheel over them. And then this goes into turn seven, which is the slowest turn on the track. It's a hairpin all the way down to second gear. It could be quite challenging and you can either make or lose a lot of time here. This leads onto a small straightaway into turn eight, which is our big left-hand turn on this track. It is a double apex turn. There's a wall on the right side, so you do have to be careful of that. And definitely you wanna make sure that you're braking at an appropriate time, as if you burn your brakes here or go too far, you will go into a wall, which is not ideal. So you just take turn eight here as this big double apex turn, and the exit out of this turn is really important because after this, we head onto our main straightaway of the track. As you see here, this is the turn nine complex, but for the orientation of this track that we ran both times, we actually took the straightaway part of it, which can be seen on the lower half of the screen. So turn eight leads out to this long straightaway, which leads all the way down into turn 10, big braking zone, pretty hard right-hander, and this kind of just blends right back into turn one. And that is the entire track of the Florida International and Rally Motorsport Park. So we're going to be starting out here with the bad lap, and I'm going to first say if you want to see the good lap or the side-by-side, -side, skip ahead in this video. I have made chapters, and here we go. As we come around towards turn one, you can see there's a lot of room left on the left side of the track for me to hit that I'm not using because the car is not on the edge of its grip. Going into turn two, I brake very early, much earlier than the car is capable of, and then I'm probably late on the throttle as I get into turn three. Here we're doing pretty good, obviously, as you just pretty much floor it. Going into turn four... I'm probably getting a little bit scared here and hitting the brakes a little bit hard and not giving the car as much speed through that corner as I could. 
Going to turn five, it's going to be a similar situation of breaking way too early. And as I come through here, not using the entire track. As you can see, this track is a lot of runoffs that I'm not putting to use. Once again, turn six, same scenario. There's that big uh, concrete runoff on the left side there that I'm not using. If the car was carrying as much speed as possible, I would be all over that. Through the S's, we're pretty slow. I took this pretty slow in general. I got on the brakes much harder than I needed to prior to it, and I carried less speed than I possibly could. Turn seven, we're getting a pretty good line. Decent exit out of there, using that runoff actually a little bit out of turn seven. So the exit onto this small straightaway should actually be pretty good. Going into turn eight, it's gonna be the exact same story where I'm getting on the brakes way too early. However, I am taking a pretty nice line through here in turn eight. It's the decreasing radius, double apex left-hand turn with the wall. And this will set, up, set us up for a nice exit onto the final and the main straightaway that will bring us around our entire lap. As we can look, the time is now creeping towards the one minute and 40 second mark, which is considered a pretty slow lap around this track. Getting all the way over to the left side, breaking much later than I could be, into turn 10, and that's going to be a 140.09, a pretty slow lap overall, with a lot of room to improve and a lot of speed left to be desired. So now we're going to jump into the fast lap and see what changed. So here we are on our fast lap almost a year later and coming in off the back straight away, you can instantly notice we're carrying much more speed, braking late. We're gonna use the entire runoff to the left side here, getting our left wheels all the way on it, carrying way more speed through here on throttle much earlier, braking later at the second cone there, on the throttle very early, the second I get out of turn two, I'm pretty much easing into full full throttle. That speed is going to carry all the way up to turn four, which I'm not even braking for this time. Just a quick lift, throw it in, use the entire runoff, and the car was really on its grip limit there, tires squealing. Same scenario in turn five, braking really late, give a good heel-toe downshift. You can see the car really on its edge now, using the entire runoff, tires squealing. Same thing turn six, chuck it in, use the whole runoff, use the entire width of the track. I'm basically just taking a lot more confidence through here into the S's, not even really braking, just kind of lifting off, carrying all that speed through there, powering right on through. Turn seven, getting wider out to the left so that I can create a later apex and a straighter exit out of turn seven, getting on the power earlier, which is going to propagate to more time gain down this straightaway. In general, just really being a lot more confident in myself and the car, not scared to enter a corner with a lot of speed, not scared to push the car to its grip limit. Turn eight, we're getting much closer to the wall here in between the first and the second apex, which is going to create a straighter and faster exit out onto the final straightaway and give us a lot of time gain on this lap. But mainly, it's just confidence, waiting longer to brake, carrying more speed into the corners, and really just trusting the car on its limit. As we bring it around, let's see what it's going to be. And it's going to be a 128.23, shaving about 12 seconds off of the lap that I did a year ago. As we move into the cool down lap, you can see that that was a much quicker and faster lap. I pretty much was just a lot more confident, carried much more speed in both the turns and on my turn exits, which allowed me to carry more straightaway speed and get a better time.
So as we can see from the side-by-side -side and the lap analysis right there, there was a large improvement made from the first time that I was out at the firm to the second time. And I'm just gonna give a quick five tips as to things I did to shave 12 seconds off of this lap. And hopefully they are helpful to you, or if you're just interested in getting into the track, hopefully they help you in getting started. So the first thing is going to be using the entire track in the correct line. And I touched on this a little bit on both the slow lap and the fast lap. On the slow lap, there was a lot of runoffs or width of the track that I did not utilize, whereas on the fast lap, I made sure to utilize all of that. If the car is on its grip limit and you are carrying as much speed as possible, you should have to use the entire width of the track. If you're not getting all the way to the edges, that's a sign that you could be carrying more speed. So the first time around, I was starting out pretty wide, I was doing good. If you have a right hand turn, you start left, or a left hand turn, you start right. So I was doing a good job of starting out wide and then working in towards a nice late apex when you come in and meet the inside of the turn. But then on the exit, I was either not carrying enough speed or getting on power too late because I was not powering out back to the outside of the track. So what I had changed is I was getting on power earlier and carrying more speed through, and that was allowing me to carry all the way out to the very edge of the track. That's more a symptom of some of this other stuff that we're going to talk about, but it's a good way to tell if you are on the limit or not. The correct line is also important as in you should be starting out wide, hitting a nice late apex, and then carrying back out to the outside of the track. Some of that similar stuff, just the very basics of how to take a line around a track. The next thing is going to be, as with anything, drive the track often. And this could be any track or it could be a specific track that you're trying to get faster on. Like anything in life, the more that you practice, the better you are going to get at it. So this is a track that I had ran quite a few times between the first lap and the last lap. And just by mere exposure to it and seeing it a bunch more, I was able to shave 12 seconds. And actually, I was on much worse tires for the second lap. The first lap I was on brand new all seasons, still not ideal, but the second lap I was on actually pretty worn and near bald all season tires and still managed to do that. My third tip would be go karting. Uh, go karting, go karting, uh, stupid pun, yes. But anyways, there's a reason that professional drivers get their start in karting. It's because it's a really good way to feel out how to drive a vehicle at its limit before you are doing it in a car where you might be a little bit more intimidated to or worried about damage, damaging your, pers your personal property. So I went karting quite a bit in this time period. I actually went maybe like two or three days before I went and set that second lap. And the biggest thing that karting did for me is it allowed me to really feel what it's like when a car is about to break loose. You can really tell when you're on that grip limit and when you're starting to slide around, maybe you get a snap of oversteer or anything like that, but it allows you to approach the grip limit of a vehicle from a much safer standpoint because you know how to start feeling when the car is just beginning to break loose. And when you're familiar with what that feels like, it's a lot easier to recreate in a car and make sure that you are driving the car on its limit where it's just starting to break loose, but you're not gonna go over that limit and end up spinning or anything like that because you've had the chance to make those mistakes and learn what that feels like in a cart. So that was one of the best things to kind of feel what the car was capable of by going karting. And then I feel like that transferred over to the car and on this track quite a lot. So my next thing would be memorize your braking and your turn in points and adjust them as the day progresses. So what I mean by that is say on this track, you'll notice on the, sa on the second lap, I mentioned it, the faster lap, going into turn two, I was braking at the second cone. On the slow lap, I was braking between the first and the second cone, so I was braking a little bit earlier. So I went out there and I got a good idea of what all of my braking points were, and I memorized them for each turn. So it could be a marker on the ground, it could be a line in the sand, it could be literally anything. Just find something that you can break at the same point each time and look at and tell yourself, okay, when I get to this object, I'm going to get on the brakes. And if you memorize all those braking points, you then have a consistent lap going each time. And then what you can do is adjust them as the day progresses. And this is the really, really important part. It's a continually improving process. As you do this, if you are breaking at a certain point in a turn and you realize, hey, I'm not using the whole track in this turn. I feel like I could be carrying more speed through here. The car doesn't feel like it's on its limit. Then you could try the next lap and say, okay, I'm gonna break in between the second and the third cone. You could push that breaking point back a little bit and that will allow you to carry more speed through the turn. The other thing you wanna memorize is your turn in points. This track does a really good job of pretty much telling you that. They put cones 
there's usually a final cone of where you want to turn in, but that's where you want to get off the brakes and actually start to pitch the wheel in. That will help as far as hitting a late apex and taking a good line, and you can adjust that accordingly if you feel like you're going deep into a turn or taking it too shallow and getting a bad line on the exit. You can adjust that as the day goes on, but that's a little bit more complex than the braking point. Memorizing your braking points is probably going to be the simplest and fastest way to really determine inefficiencies in a lap and then eliminate them as the day progresses. Now I'm going to be getting into my last and my final tip. This is number five, and it's probably the most advanced. This is what would be what we would call throttle driving. This is using the gas pedal to pretty much generate steering inputs in the car. The main thing that I'm talking about here, owning a Subaru BRZ, this is the tendency of the car. It understeers a lot. And using the throttle, you can correct understeer. So the big place it was getting understeer was turn eight, the big double apex left-hander. And when I was letting off of the gas, what happens is the weight all shifts to the front end of the car and it gets a lot more grip so it will pitch in more. So as I was taking turn eight and I felt like the car was not really steering in as much as I wanted to and I was feeling that understeer as I was approaching the grip limit, I just slowly ease off the throttle and that'll dive the front end in to meet a nice late apex. So using the throttle can help you steer the car and kind of adjust it when it's on its edge to get it to do exactly what you want to. Now the key here is to be very 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 soft with the throttle inputs if you are if you are harsh or abrasive with them the car will bite you if the weight transfer happens too quickly so you do have to be very careful with that and the other thing that that ties into is preventing oversteer and spins and that would be in the opposite direction when you're getting on the throttle coming out of a turn you do not want to just stomp the pedal down because that will create oversteer or cause a spin and my first time out i actually did have two spins from doing this so you want to make sure that you're just modulating the throttle very nice and slow down until you're fully flooring it kind of as the wheel straightens out as you straighten the wheel out of a turn the throttle should slowly come down with it and they should pretty much match each other perfectly to the point where you come out of the corner and you are wheel straight pedal all the way down at the same time so those are just my five tips to how i seem to be able to shave some time off of my lap. I hope they were helpful to you. And now we're gonna get into a final conclusion and summary and wrap things up. So in conclusion, today we got to comprehensively explore what the driver mod is capable of doing in a track driving sense. I originally went to the Florida International Rally and Motorsport Park about a year ago, and I set a one minute and 40 second lap in my 2014 Subaru BRZ. I went back a few weeks ago, roughly a year later, after doing a lot of things to improve my driving and gain the so-called driver mod and reduced my lap time down to a one minute and 28 second lap, shaving a total of 12 seconds off of my lap, which is a very significant increase as we saw in the side by side that we looked at in this video. We looked at the slow lap and where I was losing time, then compared it with the fast lap, saw where I was gaining that time back and eliminating the inefficiencies within the lap. We then looked at five ways to gain the so-called driver mod and to eliminate these issues within your own laps, and hopefully that was helpful to you. And if you're still in tune at this point, I would really appreciate if you subscribe to the channel, it would help a lot. We're on the road to our first thousand and you could be a part of that. So with that being said, thank you for watching and I hope you found this video helpful. Have a nice day.